And now we are going to jump into the advantages of thin veneer over full bed culture. And uh, once again, I am Linda from Realstone Systems. And then um, I'm actually based out of our Denver warehouse. As I had mentioned earlier, we have a location, we're headquartered in Troy, Michigan, where we have inventory and stock. We have a warehouse here in Denver and then in California also. So across the country, we have Stone. Um, and I, as I said, I'm the A&D rep. So I, I love to work with architects, designers, um, you know, try to, to find solutions for your projects. And then this course, this continued education course, you get one CU credit for uh, AIA, IDCE, um, kitchen and bath. So we, you know, they, you can get one credit for um, attending this class today. In addition to that, additional classes. Okay, so what we're gonna learn today is kind of a basic overview of the history of thin veneer how it came about, the advantages over cultured bed and full bed, or I'm sorry, cultured stone, and then the uh, different applications and techniques and installation information. So we're gonna kind of review things. If you have questions, I know there's a chat room, um, just kind of raise your hand and uh, Grosna will stop me. Sometimes I ramble, so excuse me on that, but uh, a lot to talk about. Anyway, what is thin veneer? So basically it's, um, a relatively new product. It came about in like, let's say the mid eighties um, when actually when cultured stone came about the full bed guys were like, okay, we can come up with a lighter alternative that you can directly adhere. So then that's when they started putting it into a panel format. Um, so there's some, you know, limitations that we have, but um, it ranges from about a half inch to an inch and a half in thickness. And then all the products are under 15 pounds per square foot. So they directly adhere so no anchors required or uh, additional structural support is needed. So it's non-load bearing, no ties needed. And then being in a fab fabricated panel, it goes up a lot more efficiently. Um, I would say it's a consistent, inconsistent panel because it's very consistent around the perimeter, but each piece varies per piece. So you're getting that random look without individually putting the pieces together and figuring out what goes where. So as we all know, labor costs are through the roof and being a pre-assembled panel, it goes up much more efficiently than individual pieces. And you know what you're gonna kind of get, right? Um, this chart shows you uh, the density. So depending on the stone type, let's say the left um, cube, uh, it's 180 cubic square feet. Um, as I said, we have to work with that under the 15 pounds per square foot. So let's assume the, uh, the, the A is a limestone. So a limestone is a little bit more dense than let's say a travertine. So depending on the density of that stone, it determines how thick we can cut that piece of, you know, that slab of the stone. So using 180 cubic square feet, uh, limestone, we can only cut it three quarters of an inch thick to equal that 11.25 uh, square foot per, you know, directly here. Whereas like a travertine is a little bit lighter, it's more porous, there's open, you know, spaces and gaps within there. So we can actually cut a thicker slice of a stone. So depending on the stone type, it determines how thick we can cut that and shave that piece of um, stone off. And then some advantages of thin veneer, basically it has the aesthetic of a full bed without the additional weight. And it ranges from about a half inch uh, to an inch and a half in thickness, depending on it. It takes up less real estate. Uh, being a pre-assembled panel, it also goes up, as I keep talking about, a lot more efficiently than um, individual pieces and you know kind of what you're gonna get. And then it's also easier to handle physical demands, um, you know, up scaffolding and all that kind of great stuff. It's hard to, you know, individually put the pieces in, giant crates full of stone versus uh, nice manageable sized boxes that you can, you know, move from A to B. So why thin stone? So usually I have people in front of me and say, does anyone recognize any of these pictures? But um, this is actually Mach Machu Picchu. So man has been using stone as the oldest building material for centuries, right? Um, but as we now know, you know, we can't achieve or accomplish this anymore. But um, um, basically it's um, the first dry stack stone veneer that we've seen. It's actually granite quarried. They, they, they um, if you notice the granite slabs have a, um, they're all dry stacked, but they're in a trapezoidal shape, radius corners. So all the windows, everything has that tri trapezoidal shape to it. So those stones are so tightly stacked in there, you can't even get a piece of paper in between them. 
and they've they've basically survived you know the test of time, moisture, expansion, and contraction, and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, but you know clearly we can't build things like this anymore with you know the cost of things, and it would just you know be unrealistic. And then uh, probably in the mid 1800s, uh, the, the guys started getting a little bit more creative uh, with stone. So this is actually a limestone, and they started you know being a little bit more creative with carving busts and. Um, but anyway, apparently Charles Dickinson's one of those busts right there. But um, as I said, they um, are carving all different types of neat things that you can do with stone. And then also in the mid 1800s, we started seeing some of the first signs of a veneer. So it's not structural, it's only on the exterior. Um, the cobblers would go out into the field, measure out, they'd you know, get a big stack of stone, they measure out the individual stones and start stacking the stones and then come back and, um, and, and then grout or tuck point it. So very labor intensive again too. And then, um, as I said, when cultured stone came about in like the mid 70s, 80s, um, this is, you know, the stone guys are like, oh, well, let's put it in a veneer format where, you know, it's not very creative, but it, we're slicing, we're taking a slice of mother earth and putting it on a building. And then this is actually an excellent example of, um, this is actually a limestone. So this is actually a sedimentary limestone. So if you notice on the tile, which is a, a home tile that um, all the different layers within there, the same stone and actually the same cut, it's a, a, a vein cut. So you can see what we call a ledge stone. So it's a split face limestone. So it's really cool because, you know, basically you're taking the same stone, same cut and just finishing it differently. So there's, you know, you can, what's neat about it is it's a natural stone. So you're getting the shading, the variations, and there's just really an excellent example of using the same stone in different formats. And that's kind of the nice thing with a veneer. You can, you can do that. And then uh, here we go, it's just kind of some examples of um, basically a thin veneer, it goes up a lot more efficiently, looks beautiful. If a mason would do that, it would take them who knows how long. And then we're now we're going to talk about uh, the advantages of um, well natural stone versus manufactured stone. So manufactured stone, as we all know, it's a uh, concrete material. It's uh, poured in a uh, put in a uh, form. They vibrate it, get the uh, air bubbles out, come back, and so, so it's a painted on surface. Many of you guys might know as like a lick and stick or a seventy mile an hour stone. Um, so. Over time, it, it you know it, it loses color. It it just you know it starts to crack and chip. Anywhere if you have like any sort of movement in your substrate, you're going to start seeing cracking. So the it has a shorter life cycle. So I know a lot of people like to use cultured stone. And actually, I'm in a hotel right now that has Fairfield Inn with cultured stone everywhere. And I'm like, ugh. Anyway, but um, it looks you know they try to make it look like stone, but it just doesn't have that same luster or you know the characteristics of a natural stone. And then uh, nice thing with the natural stone, basically it's a quarry material. It's natural, so there's tons of different minerals, colors, textures, um, everything within the stone. Um, and basically, what they're doing is they're cutting off the, after the guys take the big blocks out. They're coming in and collecting the scraps. Um, but anyway, the color is based all the way through. So, you know, it's really hard to duplicate that in a cultured stone. And it's, it's much more durable too. And then um, once the guys bring the scraps back to a factory, basically that's the cool thing too. You can really put it in different formats. So there's tons of different, there's the, actually like a big giant cutter. So they're gonna cut it in approximately an inch um, inch thickness. And so you're actually using both sides of the stone. So you're getting a, a better yield out of each piece of stone. And then once again, natural stone has uh, tons of different striations. Uh, it's really hard for man, you know, cultured stone to duplicate that. Uh, manufactured stone is only for vertical surfaces only. Natural stone is uh, very dur durable. You can use it vertically and horizontally. And then natural stone has a lower processity than um, like a manufactured stone. And then we have full bed. So everyone loves full bed, right? But it's, uh, as we all know, it's very expensive. Uh, this is actually a picture of, a, it's actually a 45 foot wall where um, actually an engineer is required because every 18 inches on center, it's gotta be anchored back to your wall. 
Um, it's very, once again, very labor intensive. It's set in a mortar bed. Um, engineering is required. Corners actually have to figure out what's gonna go where. I always say a big puzzle, right? Um, you're trying to pick and choose. I go you know, to different jobs and I see natural stone and a, a giant crate. And it's like, okay, what do I do? Where do I start first, right? But um, very labor, labor intensive, but it looks, you know, it's, it's, it's very expensive, but it looks great. And then the thin veneer, nice thing with thin veneer, usually, um, you know, basically, as I had said, they, they cut the face off so you're getting a better yield out of your stone. You can directly adhere it because it's under that 15 pounds per square foot. And then a lot of times the corners are a unit set. So actually the one on the left, um, they're a, a partner. So they'll come in a box individually wrapped together. And actually on the back side, they're jigged to go together. So, um, and then also too, if you have any movement in your substrate, it's gonna kind of flex and give. Um, so, you know, when we talk about, you know, pulling, picking and choosing pieces to go where, this basically, it's a married set. You pull it out of the box, stick it and go. Um, and then there's other veneers too that actually wrap the corner look like a full bed too. So there's ways, you know, as I said, thin veneer goes up a lot more efficiently. And I always talk about time and labor and all that stuff, as we all know, labor's through the roof these days. So with everything else, right? And then how is it made? So um, basically post-industrial pre-consumer. So after the guys take the big blocks out, uh, they come in and um, collect some of the scraps, take it back to a factory. So it's a controlled environment. So we're getting a better yield here. We kind of go here. So you can see, you know, they come in, depending on the, the type of stone and the cut, they collect the scraps and then they take it back to a factory and you can basically manipulate stones into different formats. Big tumblers, giving it different textures, cutting. Um, the pre-assemble a, a, a paneled system. It's, I always talk about prefab, right? It's gonna go, it's a, basically a, a mold that they use. They use a low VOC bond and there's numerous different ways that you can lay the panels out. So um, besides being very, as rectified, if you look at the panel at the bottom, you go around the perimeter, everything's very smooth. I would say it's a smooth, but then the interior, there's specific hatch patterns. So depending on the stone, it's a consistent inconsistency. So you're gonna get that dimensional look uh, without the labor of individually putting the pieces in. And it's gonna go up a lot more efficiently being rectified um, because um, there's companies that they call it tight tolerances. So you're not gonna, you know, as I said, you go around the perimeter and it's gonna just dry stack up and nice and tightly. So, so panelized system in a jig, they come back, controlled environment. So you get a really consistent product. And then another thing that's also important, I had mentioned earlier too, you know, you go to job sites and you see a big crate just full of individual pieces. It's like a giant puzzle. Um, so trying to figure out what's gonna go where. Some of the big box stores is a picture on the bottom left. You can see some of the inconsistencies of the stone. Um, each piece is just thrown in the box. I mean, a lot of times there's breakage and that kind of, you know, you, there's a lot more waste than should be. Uh, a good manufacturer over on the right each piece, if you notice in the box, each piece is um, individually wrapped. The boxes are banded. There's lot numbers, consistency. So there's great care in delivering an awesome product to the field. Also nice too are those, those straps that are on the boxes are actually, you can use those as handles. So transporting up, you know, scaffolding, you know, just moving it from point A to point B, it's a lot more efficient too. And again, eating to your labor costs, individually running back and forth, trying to figure out what's gonna go where. And then uh, this just shows you corners and flats. So once again, a pre-assembled panel, um, it's a married set corner, um, you know, so efficiently of going up onto the wall, just pull it out of the box, skim, skim, stick and go, and we'll go over installation too. But, um, and then the panel, as I said, it's very consistent around the perimeter and they just uh, work together nicely. And then full bedded cultured, um, it's like a puzzle. You know, you gotta pick and choose what's gonna go where. And then we talk about quality control. So things when you know, I had just mentioned the big box stores um, and then the thickness. So um, when you look at a panel and a, a, a paneled system, make sure the gauge is consistent. Um, it needs to range from about a half inch to an inch and a half in thickness. 
Um, so look at the quality of the stone. You know, when you pull it out of the box, does it crumble? Uh, so there's a lot of things that you need to pay attention to in the field too when you're you know when you're picking products. Um, the face size we can we do have some limitations though. Um, the face size we can't exceed 36 inches in any one direction and or five square feet of total surface area. So we do have some limitations on that. And then height wise, um, as I always defer to the TCNA. So we're considered a large format tile. So think about it like a large format tile minus the grout. Um, height restrictions, no more than 30 feet without consulting an engineer. And then exteriorly, um, you need an expansion joint. So um, it's exteriorly, it's eight to 12, and then you can try to get up to 16, but it kind of depends on your building and what you've got going on. But usually you can um, do a soft joint or expansion joint. Um, you know, you can work it in with windows and try to make it a little bit more creative. So there are ways, because I know people are like, oh, we have to put an expansion joint in, but there's some, uh, you know, caulks uh, that you can actually fill it, that color match the stone or what have you, that you can just work into your design. So don't let that be a limitation. Um, and then interiorly, you can do 20 to 25 feet. So those all being considered and then color consistency. So it is a natural stone. And I would say compared to like a slate. So basically um, you, when you pull it out of the box, pull it from random boxes. So you're getting kind of the blend of different stones and different panels. So it just kind of varies. And then the stone integrity, I was talking earlier, you know, make sure that the quality, it's not shaling, it's not chipping, it's not falling apart. Um, so there's all those things that go into looking for a quality product and having the testing behind it. And then the cool thing with the paneled system, you, there's tons of different formats that you can put your um, tiles in. I'm gonna have a sip of water, excuse me. <laughs> anyway, there's tons of different uh, varieties depending on the stone type. Um, it determines how we engineer it or cut it. And, and um, you know, there's different formats in that. And then the different varieties. So sandstone, slate, and quartzite are actually pulled out in sheets. So um, depending on the cuts, there's a bed face, there's a uh, ledge stone. We had talked about um, that limestone earlier, which are actually, so granite, limestone, and marble are actually pulled out in, um, in blocks. So you can get a split face, ledge stone. So there's a lot more ways you can manipulate the stone. And then the different varieties um, and the different species. And actually a couple of weeks ago, Kevin had done a CU on, he really broke down, you know, cemetery metamorphic and AUS types of stone. And basically all stones are created equally and depending on the stone and usability. So if you have a moment, take, a, uh, take an hour and listen to that CU because it really goes into detail about the different species. But, um, and then, as I said, not every stone is treated equally and there's a most scale of one to 10. And so it kind of depends on the project, uh, what you're looking for in you know, usability, interior, exterior, vertical, horizontal. So there's a lot that goes into, you know, besides color, which everyone, you know, I want white marble, but um, it just kind of depends on where it's located and your expectations of that particular stone. So listen to his CEO, because it actually is a really good one and I should listen to it again, but. Anyway, and then this shows you some different fabrication methods. We were talking about beds, uh, bed face or vein cut. Uh, so bed is like a flurry cut. That limestone fireplace I had shown you earlier, and you can see all the different, it's a sedimentary stone. So you can see in the vein cut, you can see all the different layers over time have compacted into that. Um, and then a flurry cut basically is um, like the bed of the floor. So it's, I would say the bed face or, you know, um, of the flurry cut, but um, depending on the cut it, and then the stone type, what you can do with it, it determines the types of cuts and all that kind of stuff. And then on that note too, so depending on the stone type, it determines what we basically can do with it. Um, so we have ledge stone, ruble stone, saw bed ashlar, castler, and then the prefabricated panels. We're gonna kind of see some examples of that. So once again, the lead stone is a split face, uh, many different textures and, and, and really dimensional looking. Uh, the ruble is more a mosaic uh, pattern, kind of a random. 
And then we have saw bed ashlar, which is um, bigger pieces and cuts. And But uh, these are all full bed, very labor intensive to put up. Um, down on the bottom one is a castle on a radius. So you gotta figure out what's gonna go where and, and uh, try to figure out from there. And then with the prefabricated panels, you know, there's numerous different, you know, you could take the same stone and put it in different formats. So you get, there's, you know, tons of different variations and cuts that you can do with it. Um, the nice thing about a panel system, it takes the guesswork out of assembly. Uh, the pictures I had shown you previously, they got to figure out what goes where. So that's kind of the cool thing. You can take the same stone and just put it in different formats. And then the value differences. So natural stone versus, uh, versus uh, manufactured stone. So natural stone, everyone loves natural stone, right? And, but it varies state by state. So, you know, in those different qualities and consistencies, like an Indiana limestone is gonna be a lot less expensive in Indiana versus like in California. So, you know, there are, you know, regional availability in the, the, it's kind of determines the cost of the product. In addition to natural stone, um, also can increase your cost because you know, depending on the project, you need engineer to anchor it, smaller projects, you know, high walls, where, as I had mentioned, an engineer, um, and then the corners, you got to figure out what's going to go where, and then the, um, the radius work, trying to, you know, fix what's going to go where. And so a lot more labor intensive than, um, than uh, a panel system. And then Back to the thin veneer. So basically you get a higher production rate on um, your labor costs. It should go up, you know, I've seen guys lay between like four and 600 square feet up a day. Once they get going, you know, they just start, you know, flying down the row. Um, and, you know, as I said, you can get a job done within a day or two versus like a Mason would come in and, and trying to figure out what's gonna go where. So, and then you also get a higher yield out of your stone material too, because you're using both sides of the face so there's a, you know, less um, stone being used. And then the pre-assembled panel takes the guesswork out. So once again, labor, labor, labor. And the, the corners, as I said, um, they're pre-engineered so you know how it's gonna fit together. And then uh, veneer versus mechanically anchored. So thin veneer, as I kind of had said, you get a higher production rate, but we do have some limitations on size so that you can directly hear. So once again, no more than five square feet of total surface area that can be directly adhered or we can't exceed 36 inches in any one direction. So we do have some limitations on size that we can directly adhere. And then this one, uh, basically local labor, uh, labor or local cost estimates. So if you notice that all the dollar signs are about equal. So stone, uh, thin veneer, cultured stone, full bed, they all you know, kind of run the gamut on pricing. You know, there's really inexpensive stuff that you can buy at a box store. And then you know, there's higher price quality stones that you can buy that have the testing, the packaging, they're not crumbling. So you know, it's same thing with culture. There's some really good cultured stone out there and then there's the stuff that you know, looks terrible. And, but and then same thing with natural stone, um, you know, a regional availability. And so there's a lot that goes into, you know, the different products that are on the market. It's just a matter of, you know, looking, I was, as I had mentioned this at the beginning, just don't look at the overall, or don't look at the upfront cost, look at the overall cost. Because as we know, labor is crazy these days and it's getting worse and worse, so. Now we're gonna jump into basic techniques um, and, and substrates and um, basically mortars and all that kind of great stuff. So we're gonna talk about masonry substrates, uh, some different uh, installation methods, interior, exterior, waterproofing options, and then stone basically cuts like a, you know, with a wet saw. So we're gonna jump into that next. And then, um, so masonry substrates, let's start there. So, um, over on the left is kind of the old school way, uh, lath plaster, you know, they, they, they put their felt, they do the lath, the plaster. Every time that they put a layer in, they're penetrating their substrate. So over time, you know, those, those, those nails or whatever they're using to uh, keep that up there is gonna start rusting over time. So um, it's damaging, it's letting moisture back into there. Kind of the new way of doing things is over on the right, you can see then there's different systems. And I would say single source system and look for 
companies that have warranties and um, information for that. But the new way, cement board is a nice smooth substrate. Um, then there's an air water membrane in there with an anti-fraction in there, and then a polymer modified type bed mortar. So you're going wet to get wet, and we'll discuss that in a second. But looking for a single sourced um, you know, manufacturer that works with another company that, you know, so it's all, all your details are together and they're working as a, a, a source together rather than fighting with different companies and things like that. And then in addition to some um, additional um, installation, I always talk about cement board because being um, a rectified panel, it's very smooth on the back. Lath and plaster, it's very hard to get a smooth substrate. So cement board, you can actually throw your cement board up. Uh, there's an air water membrane that you roll on. And then you know, we're going to talk about 100% coverage, but um, a medium modified type bed mortar. They're basically going to skim coat their substrate. They're going to butter the back of the panel. And so you're going to go wet to wet. But cement board is nice and smooth. So if you have an imperfection, like with your lath and plaster, it's going to kind of keep the panel out and you're going to start a, you know, it's not going to be as smooth as you would want. So I always refer people to cement board because it goes up a lot more efficiently than um, lath and plaster. But sometimes you have to, and I'll put a picture up here, I'll show you too. Anyway, some more details on you know, CMU, um, different applications. Uh, this is the picture I was just gonna reference to was, um, you know, it depends on your substrate, right? So here, clearly there was, I don't know what was going on at the bottom, there's CMU, and then they had to use lath and plaster. So maybe the substrate wasn't sound and they had to you know, come back and use a lath and plaster method to, to make it work. And then we talk about the different, different adhesive options. So thin set and then versus medium bed. So thin set was actually developed by the tile, um, tile companies. Um, so it's actually designed for, it collapses versus like a medium bed that has a little bit more sand and body to it. So depending on your application, interior, exterior, vertical, horizontal, um, you need to kind of determine, talk to your professional on who, you know, what type of uh, mortar is better. But um, we recommend a polymer modify, whether it be a thin set versus a, a medium bed. Uh, and then NNS, uh, you can achieve that sticking, but I always say NNS are more designed for stacking versus the polymer modified are designed for sticking. So there are ways, you know, I know guys that, you know, use an N or an S and they add an add mix to it. But a lot of times you don't know what you're going to get. I mean, it could be a Friday afternoon, dust gets in there, who knows, and they don't mix it properly. And then you start having failures down the way. So again, it's, it's um, manufacturers out there that, that really um, pay attention to all these things and are always looking for new and approved ways too. So it's the role of the manufacturer to recommend uh, the proper setting materials. Expansion joints. Um, so basically, if you have an expansion joint in your substrate, you need to bring that through. And anywhere you hard install, basically, you need to have a soft joint. Um, any sort of, you never want to hard install against a window frame or something like that. You need to come back and, um, you know, caulk it and allow for that expansion and contraction. Um, as again, I had referred to the TCNA. So we basically think about it like a large format tile. So de defer to that. And then as I mentioned this too earlier, um, you know, hundred percent coverage is very important. And then expansion joints, eight to 12 exteriorly up to 16, try to coordinate it with some of your design and uh, interiorly it's 20 to 25 feet. So just, Kind of depends. Make sure you uh, allow for moisture and expansion and contraction and 100% coverage. And then here we go. <laughs> Quality control. So uh, speaking of 100% coverage. So yeah, so uh, basically the method of a large format. So you're going to skim coat your uh, butter the back of the panel itself, skim coat your substrate, key it in, wet to wet, 100% coverage. And then consistency of layout. We kind of touched on this earlier too. Make sure that you pull, you dry lay it out first, and you you know you pull from random boxes, so you're getting that um, that blend, that color blend. Um, and then exteriorly, we you always want to monitor your air temperature. You know, ideally 70 degrees, right? Um, I live in Colorado, and the the temperature fluctuates from you know I'll, I'll I actually live in Breckenridge, and I start the morning out, and it's like 20, and I get down to Denver, and it's 75 or 80. So it's like, okay, what do I wear? 
but um, you need to monitor your air temperature. There are ways to get around that through tenting, um, you know, protecting your, you know, they, a lot of times they'll tent and then heat it, but um, never install it below 40 degrees and not above 90 degrees. So, you know, as I said, there's ways the guys do get around that by you know, some, using other methods. Hey, Linda, George yeah. had a question. Okay. Um, about expansion joints in South Florida with heat and humidity. Is that something you can address? Um, I'll try. So basically, um, you know, there are the TCNA recommends, you know, a soft joint, depending on whether, whether it's interior or exteriorly. Um, and there's a silicone, you know, and it allows for expansion and contraction. So depending on the application, interior, exterior, um, you know, there are companies that have like, they put like a foam, it's like a tube through your foam that you put back in your joint and then you fill it with a caulk. So it allows for that movement. So the heat, no matter heat or cold, it's everything expands and contracts. So um, just make sure that you don't like around window frames, you hard, you don't want to hard install. So it allows for that movement. Thank you. We won't be able to install today because it's 92 in uh, Jupiter, Florida. <laughs> Well, Kevin, you want to jump in there on the heat? I don't know. <laughs> so maybe in the after, actually, maybe start your project in the morning. And so it's not the dead of the heat and then wait for the afternoon to cool down and then continue to install. Hey, yeah, I, real quick, temperature, the, the guidelines for the TCNA are, are 20 to 25 inside, like Linda said, and, and um, eight to 12 outside, uh, eighth inch. Um, I think on a stone, we've never had a failure based on um, expansion that we know of. And it's because more importantly than even those, because a lot of our panels go together. There's no, there's no grout joints and grout joints allow for movement too. And all buildings, those changes of planes, those uh, dissimilar materials, like Linda mentioned with the window, um, with the windows or vents or hard, installing into a floor or a corner or a ceiling. If we're able to monitor those, and um, those would be filled with, a, if it's outside, an exterior rated caulk that's flexible. Um, EJ171, Linda referred to, is in the TCA manual. And that shows you that the different joints that you can apply. Always, you know, uh, keeping in mind if it's a pre-poured wall to honor the, the pore uh, whether it's a cold joint or, 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 a, um, or, or a, just a different pour. But um, so every building's different. And if you have a particular question, I just encourage you to reach out to us. Generally speaking, though, we default to that TCNA, uh, but we've got plenty of uh, jobs over almost 20 years span that uh, we can show that are still installed and have worked in direct sunlight in Florida, or you may uh, treat entryways with large windows and commercial buildings or uh, residential with uh, pool areas as an exterior area because of the heat and the sun and the intensity of that too with the expansion. So uh, kind of vague, but we can get more particular and feel free to reach out and call us afterwards. We'd be happy to uh, talk through anything that you've got as far as details and drawings. We've got some drawings as well that can illustrate what we're talking about. Thank you. Awesome, great question. Um, and then also the polymer modified type bed mortar. So that actually allows for movement. So it's, it's got some flexibility to it too. So, um, and then, you know, what's behind there, your air water barriers and all that kind of stuff too. So it just, as I said, it depends on where it's at. And, you know, there, as Kevin said, the TCNA is a great resource for product information. And then speaking of failures, <laughs> nice lead into. Um, so basically, I, one thing I did want to mention too, so also grade, uh, another question I get about, you know, height restrictions, uh, grade, once again, we're going to defer to the TCNA, kind of a standard is about four inches above grade, never below, but depending on your environment um, and the slope of your grade, it just kind of determines, you know, how far you can, you know, keep it off the ground, you know, and like in Colorado, you know, we've got a huge snowfall, you know, so you know, I don't know what their standards are, but I would say at least, you know, eight to 10, 12 inches above grade. So it just kind of depends on the situation. And then now we're gonna talk about failures. So um, as I had mentioned to lead into that. So um, 
spot bonding is always a big no-no. The one on the left, as you can see, the guy plop, plop, relied on pressure to keep up, uh, keep that on the wall. The first, you know, moisture that's got behind there expanded and contracted and started popping the uh, stones off. Um, over on the right, same thing, the guy, a masonry, he, you can use, I'm sure he used like a point trowel, went around the perimeter, relied on pressure to keep that up there. Um, you can notice the substrate is very smooth, so it didn't really grip into it. So as I said, pay attention to when your installers are, um, you know, installing different stones. The one on the left is a column. I always say peanut butter and jelly. You butter one piece of bread, you try to stick it to a dry piece that doesn't stick. You butter one, you butter the other, you have to peel them apart. And then um, you were just talking about temperature. So actually the building over on the right, big project for me up in Michigan when I lived up there, big exterior commercial project, beautiful limestone, dimensional. And then on the under soffit, um, this, the tile started delaminating and popping off the first, you know, it was, I think they installed this like in the middle of the summer. Anyway, the architect called me up and said, hey, your stone's failing. I said, no, well, let's, let me call, let me call the, 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 the setting material guy. We, we, all, we all did a job meet. Um, so there's several things going on wrong with this particular project. If you notice, first of all, there's not 100% coverage. Um, you can kind of see in the background that air water membrane that's not um, completely covered. In addition to, you could flex, you pushed on the um, soffit area, it would flex. So that was wrong. And then in addition to, um, it's very important to clean your material too. So I've got an image I'll show you in a bit, but clearly he didn't, so there was a bond breaker. So he, there must've been dust or something on the back of the tile. And then he plop plopped and then tried to stick it up onto the ceiling. Um, as I said, the first, you know, change of you know, season, freeze thaw or whatever, they started popping off. So once again, you know, there's several different issues here, but once again, single source companies that work together with different partners is always very helpful. And we got this resolved uh, fairly quickly and uh, they replaced the product and now it looks beautiful. So yeah. Anyway, some more failures. Once again, uh, we had talked about change of plane. Uh, they basically hard installed against that vent. There's heat coming out of there. Um, you know, so clearly that's not right. The one in the middle, there must have been, I don't know, but um, you know, somewhere moisture was getting behind the stone and it caused it to leach rust out of the top. So maybe it wasn't, um, you know, uh, the substrate wasn't, what's, I can't remember the word I'm looking for, but um, clearly there wasn't enough, um, you know, moisture prevention around the top and moisture got behind there. And then this is an excellent example of showing the proper way to install um, any sort of tile, so forth. So once again, if you notice he's cleaning the substrate, I talked about that limestone that wasn't cleaned properly. So besides cleaning the, the stone itself, you also need to clean the substrate. So cement board, um, you know, basically it's a bottom up installation. So you get a nice level, um, you know, starter board. You want kind of a peanut butter cons consistency of mortar. Then basically you're going to trowel your substrate with approximately a half inch trowel, but it kind of depends on your, your type of application. Um, so 100% coverage there. You're going to burn the mortar in the back of the panel itself. So 100% coverage. And actually the panel to the left is a really cool panel because it's a pre-assembled. It's not your typical veneer. It's actually adhered to a stainless steel mesh and then they use like a low VOC bond. So that one goes up really efficiently and um, it's, it's cool because each piece is, it's very consistent around the perimeter, but each piece varies per piece. So you're getting that random look without once again, the labor of individually putting the pieces in. So a really cool product. And then here we show basically wet to wet. He's gonna burn it. He's gonna kind of wiggle it into the mortar bed. So you're getting that 100% coverage. And then every now and then you wanna test your panel. So you wanna pull it off and see if you're getting that transfer of mortar onto your, you know, on the panel itself and um, your substrate. But if you notice at the bottom, um, you can see some, you know, where it didn't even touch. So you may either need to adjust your, your mortar or you just need to, or your trial size, just every now and then check your panels to make sure you're getting that, you know, 100% transfer as close to as. 95, I think 95% is effective, but um, preferably 100%. And then it's the role of the manufacturer to uh, have warrantied systems. I had mentioned earlier, single source. 
So that's always good. And then um, grounding options. So once again, full bed, cultured, individually putting the pieces in. You got to let that set up, come back the next day or two, come back and tuck point it or grout it. Very time consuming. And then we have dry stack. Looks great too. Individually put the pieces in. You got to figure out what's going to go where. I've gone to numerous jobs where you, you walk by and the stone is like an ugly piece going the wrong direction, right in the middle. And you're like, oh my gosh, what happened? Anyway, and then the panel systems basically skim, skim, stick it and go. And um, as I said, it goes up a lot more efficiently than individual pieces. And then environmental consideration. Uh, stone is um, the most sustainable, I would say, and um, it has some green properties to it. Life cycle, uh, basically your life cycle costs, it's gonna last a lot longer than cultured and full bed, or not full bed, but I'm sorry, cultured stone. Um, most of it, a lot of stones have lead points and can qualify for um, reclaimed. So there's several advantages to that too. And then once again, I, we always defer to the professionals, the TCNA and the international, the IBC. So refer to those guides as proper, you know, expansion joints, uh, installation methods, all that kind of great stuff. Anyway, once again, this was brought to you by the Natural Stone Institute. As I said, um, there's some great resources out there. If I don't know the question, you heard Kevin in the background. Uh, he's a great, uh, very knowledgeable about stone, setting materials, whatever you guys need to know. Uh, Real, Real Stone System is a company. We do an excellent job with customer service, trying to support architects, designers. So feel free to reach out anytime. And then cool thing about paneled systems, there's numerous types of applications. And actually this is a really cool one because they, you know, they did, they cladded the interior and then brought it on the outside. So you get more of a seamless look. Some other great um, installations and actually I have a Florida guy. So that uh, is at Disney World where they used um, our stone up on a fountain, which is kind of cool. Tons of moisture. <laughs> Anyway, some great cladding options, interior, exterior. And it's really hard to find where the panels start and stop. On that note, I like to see a running bond in the third. So you're gonna kind of stagger your panels on the third versus the half. Um, but some great installations, interior, exterior, fireplaces, feature walls, uh, radius work. I get that question asked a lot too. Um, depending on the gauge of the stone or the thickness of the stone, you can usually get between like a 12 and 14 foot radius horizontally, or you can always field cut to compensate that radius. And or the stone looks awesome too vertically. And actually you can take the stone vertically and get approximately a three inch radius, like for fire pits and things like that too. So there's actually in Chicago, there's a really neat uh, project where they did columns vertically and it looks awesome. So kind of fun. I think you probably find that um, in some of our pictures on our website. And then some, just some more commercial projects. There's a limestone. Um, actually, the one over to the left is it's called Hive, which is an engineered stone. Really fun. Um, it's 90% marble dust, 10% resin. So really neat product, non-porous. But there's tons of different things you can do with thin veneer. Some wonderful applications. This is actually another fun project for me. It tells you the, the, the quality of, our, of, of a good quality stone veneer. Um, this is a charcoal slate. And then the white, uh, actually it's a gray, that uh, white birch, which is a limestone. They, the architect had, basically they, they um, took the stone, they shipped it out to a CNC router. They cut the panels out, you know, the Spartans out of stone of our panels. They shipped it back to the job and then the installers installed it like that in the field. Really neat project. It's up in Michigan. It's kind of another fun one. They took it, you know, kind of an angle, really give it that dimensional look on a radius. Actually, this is that project I was talking about in Chicago. They took it vertically. And then there's several tools out there that you can use to really visualize how, you know, something different than drywall is gonna look on a wall. 
So it really gives, it, it really adds a lot more character, the natural tones, and it just really brings out a lot more dimension to a room. And then hopefully today we learned some of the advantages of a thin veneer and basically that rate right, needs to be under that 15 pounds per square foot. Can range from about a half inch to an inch and a half in thickness. Uh, there's many different cuts and variations. Natural stone is more durable, has a longer life cycle than uh, cultured. And then um, as I had mentioned and I preach it all day long, labor costs should be a lot less than your typical uh, masonry either cultured and or full bed. And then there's numerous different options on usability, backsplashes, fireplaces, exterior buildings, you name it, um, a panel, a quality paneled stone can go anywhere. And then garage to touched on, make sure that you register online for um, your credit. If you have questions on that, please feel free to reach out to us. As I said, we're very helpful on trying to get everyone information, whatever questions you might have, we are always happy to help. And thank you. Linda, before you leave. All right, I'm not done yet. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, I have a quick question if you don't mind. Um, sure. Cost wise, I know everything's gonna vary based on the stone you select, I'm assuming. And, Correct. And the installation, whether it's interior, extra stuff, but you know, it's less money because it's less labor intensive, but obviously you gotta have a qualified installer that knows how to do it for your recommendations. So that's kind you know, of a, a thing to watch out for, I'm sure, with your specifications. But what is the real average cost per square foot for this type of stone installed? I mean, you know, is it like 10 to 20 a square foot or is it 8 to 10? I mean, what's the kind of range to expect to, to expend or budget? Well, it, as you kind of mentioned earlier too, so it depends on the stone type and then we have different formats. So um, it kind of depends on that and then square footage too. So I, you know, the stone itself is gonna range from let's say about $10 to probably $25 a square foot. Like um, some of the larger on the stainless steel, um, that's probably in the $25 you know, dollar a square foot price point. And then labor, you know, it used to be basically budgeted out as a large format tile minus the grout. So it's it installs like a tile, but you don't have to come back and grout it. So, you know, it kind of depends on who, you know, Masons do a great job exteriorly, um, but there are, you know, they have the scaffolding and all the tools. So really, I know it's a hard question to kind of answer, but, well, you know, yeah, into say, guys, least expensive um, $10 oh, up to $30, let's say. Is that installed uh, cost you're saying? Uh, yeah. So Ray, it, it, it depends. Number one, you got to take into consideration are you in union or not union market, what the prevailing wage is per square foot. Um, I mean, we have products that the union guys love because they hit their they hit their rate by like one o'clock in the day. They can only install 150 square feet of stone if it's a division four exterior spec and they're done and they get paid for the whole day. Yeah. Um, so then you're looking at a day cost. Of, that's, a, that's an easy on the wall cost. So, but that large format tile that Linda said is a great budgetary number to take from your master spec. And um, you can just subtract out what, what she said, because really if you use a modified medium bed uh, and a waterproof membrane on the outside, your installed cost is gonna have a lower cost than if you were to install a 48 or by 48 porcelain tile or stone tile on the wall inside or outside. And, and as the specifiers, you might wanna consider how you do that in division four versus division uh, nine finishes inside because sometimes those techniques that are used to install outside are lath and mortar. They add days and labor to the job site. And I'm not trying to be evasive, but there's a lot of consistencies. And if we were standing in a room, like Linda said, we'd say, if you specify how to install this in division four, the exterior, is it the same way that you install it on the interior minus a waterproof membrane? And most people would say no, or at least they, you know, it's starting to have a bit of a paradigm shift. Yeah. So that consideration, your ability to have a warranty system that protects against moisture outside installed like a large format tile, in a lot of cases can save days and hours and steps um, 
to uh, if you install it that way. So the on the wall cost, um, it, like Linda said, if you take if you if the material cost is twelve, uh, a lot of times you go a third, a third, a third. Uh, as the product cost becomes more, depending on the size of to uh, stone and cut, um, your on the wall cost changes. Uh, it, it'll go down based on the cost of the stone standardized, but union, non-union. Um, yeah, okay, that helps, that helps. I'm just trying to think in, in real raw terms. I know in, the, in this area of Oklahoma, you know, laying up brick is about 12 to $15 a square foot. But again, that just depends on, you know, the brick and who's doing it, et cetera. But that's kind of a general rule of thumb. So I'm just trying to get even percentage wise, if you're doing this look that you want in stone, it's probably, I'm guessing we're looking at probably 30% less expensive than real stone or maybe even as much as 40. I mean. What's your, what's your, what's your thin stone uh, on the wall cost? I don't have that. I'm sorry, I don't. All I know is that it's a lot less than you know, regular stone. But yeah. in fact, we just changed this job from uh, a real stone set to a, I guess it's a cultured stone, although it's not set yet. I mean, we're still in negotiations on the BE side, but I don't know. We're, we'll look at doing this too, because it's, we just got to hit a budget and we want the look. And I think this is a good product. There's no doubt about it. Just, you know, and I know it's less money. I was just trying to get a rule of thumb. It, it, it. I wish there was a more specific rule of thumb. I think Oklahoma is a non-union prevailing wage. So if I if I'm talking to a residential guy uh, that I know who does tile jobs, those guys will a lot of times put that on the wall. Well, they used to. Now everybody's raising their rate because they're so busy. But you know, if they if they said, "Hey, I'd put that up minus the setting materials for eight to fifteen bucks a square foot," uh, residentially speaking, commercial maybe a little bit more standardized. And sometimes the estimators, you'll spec it, but the estimators will uh, actually um, have a set cost for stone and, and things in their system that may benefit you and it may not benefit you if they're awarded that specification, depending on the system that you specify. Right, right. Well, bottom line is it's less. I know that. So, and you get a lot uh, better quality probably and, you know, it, we know it goes up faster and that, that's a big deal. Right. Thank you for the question. Well, thank you for trying to answer it. That's great. And actually, I cover Oklahoma, so I'd be happy to help too. So, okay. <laughs> and I, I'm in Wichita right now, and actually, I was in Oklahoma City yesterday. So, oh, is that right? Well, I'll send you an email of what we're looking at, and you can maybe take a look at it. Awesome, that'd be wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate the event. So anyway, if anyone has a couple more minutes, I'll, um, how are we on time? It's right at uh, 101 or 01, 02 now. Um, if anyone wants to jump off, I'd be happy to review Real Stone Systems if you have time. Um, as I had mentioned, it's a great product line. I cover, I'm based out of Colorado. I cover Oklahoma, part of Texas, um, Missouri, Indiana, or not Indiana. Anyway, several different areas. But I'm gonna kind of zip through here real quick and just talk about real stone. Um, basically, we have numerous sources for product information. We have YouTube video links. So there's some really good tutorials on just our products in general. Um, our main products that we had kind of seen as our paneled stone veneer. What I think sets us apart are our corner units that are unit set. And then in addition to, we have a natural end. And the cool thing about that piece is in the middle that it's actually chiseled on each of the six inch rise. So you can cut it accordingly. I had mentioned, um, you know, I like to see running the bottom of the third. So you cut that at eight and you would actually out of one panel, you get one linear foot. So you could use that piece for either, an, you know, as a natural edge and, or let's say you have a short return and you could do a butt joint return. So there's a lot of you know, as I said, there's solutions with all of our products. There's usually a solution. You can figure out how to, how to manage it. And then in addition to, we have coordinating accessories. We have hearth pieces, coordinating tiles. So we're just not a stone veneer company any, anymore. And then once again, we pay attention to the quality, consistency. We're very commercial focused. We have specking details, hatch patterns, Revit. Uh, we have the testing behind our stone to support that. Um, I had mentioned our packaging. We do a wonderful job packaging our stone. And then we do have um, some of our stones do qualify for lead points too. 
and customer service too. We do an awesome job with that, I think. Um, and then when we talk about our different stones and our different veneers, we have we have different profiles. So this is actually a, our Elysio line coming out of our Mexican quarry. That's another thing I want to mention. We really are more globally. We, we used to source from you know, a couple different regions, but now we're around the globe. So we're pulling from different sources throughout the world. Uh, but this is actually coming out of one of the Mexican quarries with um, two marbles, two limestones, and a ledge stone. There's a honed option. And then I always tell people to refer to those little boxes in the top corner. Um, it gives you some really good information, the testing, the or usability, how it's packaged, the weight, um, all the things that are important. And then kind of zip through some of these too. Once again, uh, we will do custom panels too. I did a really neat project up in Michigan where we use that pewter hone and the accent profile. As long as we have enough lead time, we can really do anything. I've done sills and you know, custom wall caps and things like that. So if you have the time and you're willing to work with us, we love to do, or I love to do custom projects. So um, a really wonderful product line. And then with the collection series, we have coordinating tiles. So, you know, vertically, horizontally, uh, just a really neat product. And then when we break down, he had mentioned, you know, cost wise, I was, you know, if you're on a tight budget, I always tell people to go to Shadowstone because it's most our most cost effective. It's just kind of a simple five row stone. Uh, so that's that one. Um, accent stone means there's uh, three larger pieces in the profile. So a little bit more surface area, a little bit more movement in the stone. And then thin, awesome too. Um, so that's kind of the cool thing. Once again, we have like a Sierra shadow stone, a Sierra, Sierra accent stone, and then we have a Sierra thin stone. So which means there's more uh, pieces in that six inch rise. So once again, we're taking the same stone and just you know putting it in different formats. A state stone, awesome product. Um, this is the one that I had shown you the backside. So the neat thing about this is a regular real stone is we have specific hatch patterns. Whereas the estate stone, it's very consistent around the perimeter, but each piece varies per piece. So you're getting that random look without individually putting the pieces in. And then the corner unit actually wraps the corner to look like a full bed. So really great product, really trending fast. Um, and then we have actually with, with the estate stone, we have wall caps, sills, column caps, hearth pieces that coordinate with all that whole line. And then the Portugal series, I would say this is a little bit more designer oriented. There's two limestones, two marbles and a dimensional, which is kind of a, you know, has some dimension to it and or a flat format. And then the flat's kind of cool too, because it has some texture to it. So it still has some, some different finishes within there, but a lot more does design flexibility, herringbone, you can line up the banding. It's really fun. And then this is our high product which is actually an engineered stone. So it's 90% marble dust, 10% resin. Um, I always like to point out too, so it's a dimensional stone. Um, being a poured product, it, the tolerances aren't as tight as our panels. So depending on the look that you're trying to achieve, it looks really awesome organically, more like an art piece. And or in this picture, you can see they mix three of the colors uh, to really get a really you know, dramatic effect. But um, Back to that, so it's an, a non-porous product. So um, a regular thin set won't work with this particular material. But um, as I said, I don't like spaces and gaps. So like in a wall-to-wall -wall application, I would treat it like a tile, use a small spacer and then come back and grout it to give it more of that seamless look. Kind of sim like the one at the bottom far right. And then a flat option of that same thing, engineered stone. Once again, it's UV it's stable. Um, once again, it's going to go up a lot more efficiently. It looks like wood, but it's, it has the durability of a stone, right? Um, and then um, the corners actually lock into one another. Also cuts beautifully with like a diamond blade wet saw. Looks cool vertically, horizontally. And then we actually have a real claim wood line too. Um, so we have launched, actually there's three different color options. The unfinished, which is in a sheet format, uh, approximately two square feet per sheet. Real fun, interior only, ambient temperature, no high heat, but real fun stuff. And then our tempered line, which is really awesome. This is all interior, ambient temperature, no direct water. Um, it's the cool thing about it, it's either a black limestone and or a sandstone. So each piece is one of a kind. As the stone's been cut or cleft, you get a different effect each time. And then, um, so there's a pigmented resin, pigmented resin with a foil. And then there's actually a leather tile 
um, a stone with a leather tile, or a leather infused on the top of it. So really an awesome interior. I mean, we've got some great projects. Uh, that's another nice thing. The website's got some great imagery. Um, there's some really important information within those, our website too. And there's trims. Um, in addition to, we've got some coordinating mosaics, but yeah, this line's really trending. And then we have our, also designed by Aaron, who's kind of one of our lead designer over the last five years, I would say that we started with the tempered line with her. Anyway, we just also came out with a Turkish marble, uh, really beautiful, different textures. Um, there's sea chain lure in the Fairmont collection. Uh, this is all interior, preferably, as I said, some of the marbles, you, you know, you can use vertically, exteriorly, but, you know, it kind of depends on your expectations. Really fun, in addition to here, all the trim pieces. And then we have, a, it's called Slant Stitch, also designed by uh, Aaron. This is actually a U.S. manufacturer. Um, these are the ones we stock in uh, Troy. Basically, it's a vetrified tile, so it's a clay and a quartzite, so it's very dense. It has a commercial rating, DCOF. Um, fun thing about this line too is they will custom color. So if you're working on, let's say, a, an ice cream parlor and they want a, you know, particular color, they will custom color. It's like only um, uh, like 100 square feet. And then we also just launched a new, also designed by Aaron, um, a glass mosaic line coming out of Mexico. So some really beautiful through body glass. Um, depending on, um, you know, there's actually three different collections, the Trend, the Malta, and the Mineral Collection. The Trends and the Malta are all paper face, so they're submergible, uh, so pool applications. The Mineral Collection has a little bit more limitation to it. Um, it's mesh mount, so you can't, so that's considered a bomb breaker, so you can't submerge it. Uh, but a really fun line. Uh, I've seen some really neat pool projects, feature like shower feature walls with it, but it's really a neat product. Uh, the glass actually, um, the ones that look like metal are actually, it's a mineral infused into it. So it looks like a metal, but it's actually glass. Really beautiful. And that's all I have for you guys. Please check out, if you're still on, please check out our website. It's a great tool for product information. Um, there's links at the bottom with you know, architectural information. We have an architectural document, that Revit, Seamless, all that kind of great stuff. Um, in addition to, we've partnered up with Laticrete, so it's a warranted system. If you use our products with Laticrete, and our long spec does call that out. If you have any questions, I'm here to help. Um, if you're ever in Denver, I love to be visited in our showroom and or, as I said, I cover Colorado. I think I'm just picking up Utah, Texas. Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri. So if you're in those areas, feel free to reach out to me. I'm very helpful and thank you.